Welcome back to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato here in my home office with my co-conspirator and partner in crime, Scott Bernstein. Hey, now. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Just wanted to remind everyone before we get started here, uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to our audio podcast. Please follow us on social media, uh, leave comments, you know, help spread the word. That's, that's very helpful. So we appreciate your support. Uh, we have a really cool topic today. Very distinguished guest. We're excited about, uh, Stephen Marsh is a very accomplished, um, writer. He has uh, published multiple books. He's written articles for The New Yorker, uh, The Atlantic, The Guardian, Esquire, and uh, he covers politics, literature, but he also writes about organized crime. And that's, you know, that's our subject here today. So um, we're going to talk about Chinese organized crime, and it's very global. We're going to talk about it in Canada, the United States, in Asia, in Australia. So it's going to, we're going to cover a lot of territory. But Stephen, welcome to the Original Gangsters podcast. Pleasure to be with you. Always good to talk about Sechi Lo. Yeah, yeah. So he's a, he's um, like a, maybe the most underappreciated gangland legend of the last at least the last quarter century. I mean, oh, he's the greatest. He, he's the greatest criminal of all time, and it's not yeah. close. And so let's see, let's talk about it. <laughs> and the fact that people don't know his name is just another sign of his triumph. Really. Yep. Yeah. So um, one of Stephen's um, articles. They they refer to um, Say Chi Lop as the the Jeff Bezos of of organized crime, and and there's also this idea that he's the he's the El Chapo of Asia, which Stephen points out isn't isn't quite accurate because actually El Chapo doesn't have his kind of wealth or or power. Never so. had, right? Never, <laughs> never, never did. No, right. I mean at at his peak, uh, I mean Say Chi Lop was making about eighteen billion a year in profit, so that's roughly the level of Citibank. I mean, that's like a very large corporation. Um, he was regularly doing things like losing 60 million euros a night at Baccarat. Um, you know, the, the El Chapo's cartel at its peak um, was about three billion a year. So no Mexican cartel ever got anywhere remotely close to um, to Seychelles operation. Not even close. So let let's start with his background, and eventually we're going to connect it to the, the different groups he's networked in with, which in, which includes not only the, the triads, which our audience is probably a little bit more familiar with, but eventually even the Italian mafia, the Hell's Angels, um, the Big Circle Boys. But let's start with um, with your reporting. Uh, I mean, how how did you get interested in this, and then maybe a little bit of like early bio on on um, uh, Seichi Lop. Well, he got caught in, I think it was 2019, uh, by an interagency operation that used 20 different agencies. So agencies in, from Taiwan to the FBI to, Can to the RCMP in Canada, Australia, uh, Europe, everywhere. It took them 20, uh, 20, uh, 20 agency operations to catch him. Um, at that point, he was responsible for somewhere around 80% of the methamphetamine in, in Asia, he was the major supplier for. And what, like, the reason I got interested in his story, I, you know, I'm not a gangland reporter like you guys, like, I don't, I'm not a, I, but is that he, before, it, he had been arrested and charged with, he was the largest heroin supplier into the United States in the world. So the heroin glut of the 90s, which I remember, when um, when when the price of heroin dropped to a level where it really was a kind of um, thing that could be done recreationally, even by teenagers, um, that was him. He was responsible for 90 percent of the heroin in New York City in the in the 90s. So here you have a man who personally moved the price of these products down twice, like once in the 90s, he did it with heroin and then he lowered the price of methamphetamine almost by two thirds in Asia. Um, so he was obviously um, the greatest drug trader of all time. Right. And his org and the organization, it's not really an organization, but the big circle boys that he was a part of um, were obviously doing drugs better than anyone else. Right. They were, they were just much more superior. So to me, it, like it wasn't, I wasn't really reporting on a, um, a drug story so much as a business story. Because, I mean, all these drug dealers think of themselves as businessmen. In this case, they really are just businessmen. If, if, if things get violent, if a market gets violent, they just leave. 
They don't, um, they don't, they're not interested in uh, controlling things through violence. They're not interested in markets where there are violence. And, and also connecting it to Toronto specifically, that was very interesting to me. Like why he had begun this, you don't think of Toronto as like the, the, the birthplace of great criminals, right? Um, but he was, uh, he was absolutely a creature of Toronto. He is a, he is a Toronto figure. And not just because he was lived here and started his criminal enterprise here, but because what he learned in Toronto was what allowed him to to dominate the world, basically. And so he, um, a little bit of background on him. He was, um, was he, did he, did he grow up in the um, Guangzhou region or did he actually do time in one of those prisons there? I can't, I can't remember. Nobody really knows. It, it's highly okay. unlikely that he did. Um, well, his family, like the Big Zero Boys are like a, 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 a like literally a family, uh, a series of families, uh, maybe as few as 300 people. Um, they were originally, I mean, their, their story spans the whole of the 20th century. So they were originally partisan red guards for communist China. So they were, they were the shock troops of the cultural revolution, um, highly elite partisans. And if you read the history that the Hong Kong police made of the big circle boys in the seventies, um, basically, they swam from Guangzhou. That's the red, red circle. That's yeah. the that's the area in China. They swam the 12 kilometers to Hong Kong, um, and they came. And what they had was a capacity for elite violence that nobody else had. So they had AK-47s and they had hand grenades. But also, there are stories of things like they um, like they were being pursued. They were they were they were scoping out a um, a bank job in Hong Kong, um, and they noticed that the, that a camera that an, that a, 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 a traffic camera was slowly rotated five degrees a week to see them, and they noticed and they called off the operation. Right? They were they were uh, elite paramilitary units that um, because Hong Kong was such a cash society, and there were so there, like you could break into these uh, jewelry stores and take huge amounts of money. Um, they used that paramilitary training to take huge scores i mean not like the 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 example with like it's sort of like what heat would look like you know the movie heat like they were they were those guys um except that they were really much much better than them um they did they did things like when they were scoping out a score they would notice that some other group was doing it and they would call them and say why don't we join forces and split the score they were very very reasonable murderous human beings and then they came to and then they came to canada and um canada is a very specific culture that was kind of the opposite of hong kong in the sense that um crime in canada is very tolerated i mean you know when i would talk to people about like would you consider what you bringing drugs into the united states smuggling they were like it's not smuggling when you can get on a greyhound bus and and go across the border like it's not it's not like there's some effort involved here you just literally walk it across the border um and the same thing goes for like white collar crime uh you know uh money laundering is very easy here very tolerated here but there's absolutely zero tolerance for violence any violence whatsoever leads to a police crackdown i mean that's why the banditos were basically destroyed The, the government kept changing the laws there's no constitution here Right. Like they kept changing the laws until they just arrested all the banditos and put them all all, all in jail. Um, even minor amounts of violence are treated with extreme gravity. And so they had to adapt and they became basically nonviolent, basically completely like it, 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 when markets became violent, they just left them. And so they and so that created a whole new approach to the business in the, in them um, that led to much higher stakes. They only play for the biggest possible money. And also they just don't they just don't do business with violent people, which is, um, you know, both uh, very rare in the drug world, but also leads to uh, much more sustainable models. Right. And much more sustainable ways of doing business than going out with people who could kill you. Yeah, I, there's something about that. And I, I, but I, I want to come back to some of the, you know, that transition to Canada, too. But something yeah. you point out in, in the article is that. Um, in a lot of ways, they're they're the chief supplier because of this kind of sounds funny when we're talking about the underworld, but customer satisfaction. 
the groups 100%. that they supply, the Hells Angels, the Italians, the, the Triads, like they, they have the best prices. They have the best prices. They're they're always reliable. So and they have the best prices. They're always reliable and the product is always good. And their word is yeah. is is yeah. solid. And so they it, it it's yeah. kind of interesting, but it's really like customer satisfaction. Not, why it's they not not visit creating to the top. not creating headaches in the way you do business in a gangland setting is currency. I mean, to, well, be able to, yeah. to be able to say, yeah. hey, look at our track record. It's smooth yeah. sailing. You're not going to have bumps. Yeah. But it's also, I mean, Vito Rizzuto was actually a very important figure in, in Save She Loves Life. Be, be, I mean, that's what he just brought. He had the connection with the heroin in the Golden Triangle. He brought it into Vancouver. He moved it to Toronto. That's the easy part. The next part is getting it into New York. And he basically went to the Rizzuto family and said, look, why don't we just go? You already have cocaine shipping networks um, into the United States. We'll just piggyback on your networks and we'll and we'll rearrange the, the profits accordingly. And the Rizzuto family in Montreal were, were a very unusual mafia family in that they famously preferred the open hand to the fist. They worked with Haitians. They worked with Irish people. They worked with Asian people. They were they were they were not racist, which, you know, when you talk to FBI agents, that's the defining feature of criminal organizations in the United States is ethnic loyalty. Right. Yeah. It's like black people work with black people. Mexican people work with Mexican people. Indian people work with Indian people in Canada. That's not true. Right. Like these the, like the Rizzuto family were very open. Right. Uh, <laughs> racially. They, and, and that's still true in in, um, in Vancouver. Where the gangs are there literally are they call themselves the United Nation gangs. They don't yeah. they don't have ethnic loyalty. Um, which is which also was super important for say in his history, right? Because he realized like all this ethnic loyalty is just pure nonsense and it costs you this huge amount and you have to do you really care about, you know, your the people of Guangzhou that you left behind fifty years ago that you know you, you left this country because you hated it anyway and they betrayed you. I mean you know, like, you know, like, I mean, he, there was a lot of the nonsense of organized crime was just removed um, by his association in Canada. And yeah, like he, um, I mean, the customer satisfaction part, like his innovation is very simple. Like if you want to understand why he became the biggest drug trailer in the world, it's very simple, guaranteed delivery. That was his insight. I mean, that was, that was literally all that it, it took. He was like, he went, he could go to everyone and say, I will, if, if the cops take this load of meth, It'll be replaced to you at no charge. We will take all the risk. And they just, no one can say no to that. The Yakuza can't say no to it. The Australian biker gangs can't say no to it. The bamboo people, uh, uh, like the bamboo people in, in Taiwan can't say no to it. The triads can't say no to it. I mean, it's like, you can make your own meth or I can give it to you for basically the same amount as you cost to produce it. You don't have to worry about anything. I mean, uh, they're losing power in a sense, but like this arrangement is not, um, and also, there's no violence involved, yeah. right? Losing like, power, but increasing their bottom line. Yeah, oh, exactly. It's You'd rather be money. richer or more powerful. I'd rather be richer. Well, and why are you get? Why are you in this to, for some name? For some like like you know these bike um, Australian biker gangs? It's all just money. I mean, they're meeting in hotels in Thailand and five star hotels and having large steak dinners to talk over these deals. These are these are business people ultimately, and um, you know the ability to do this where. There's no, there's, I mean, there's violence in the sense that, like, if somebody loses a load, they get killed. But there's no violence, like, you know, the ordinary mafia model is we control this market by monopoly on violence, right? Like, we, we, we have a monopoly on drugs in this area by our capacity to cause harm to people. The, the, for these people, that's childish. That's all, that's children's stuff. That's like, like, you know, and, and anyone who would do business with people like that, you know, you're, you're here to make money, not to get blown up. Right. Like, like, why would you even risk that? Jimmy, it's, it's interesting yeah. to know. And again, this is kind of an aside, but what Stephen's saying is so true. And we pointed this out and delineated and discussed um, the kind of equal opportunity uh, mafia mindset or organized crime mindset, as opposed to the ethnic loyalty or tribalism. But it's interesting to note that the further or the cl I should say the closer you get to Canada, the more it's like that in the United States. Like yeah. in in what what he what Stevens explaining 
is a is a very in, at least in my opinion it's a very New York and New York is the epicenter of organized crime uh, in terms of uh, Italian organized crime in Detroit or in Detroit in America but it, yeah. it's that's very true to New York but you come to Detroit you come to Chicago they they operate differently that's because in some ways they're closer <laughs> to the to the paradigm that's in Canada which is the is the successful paradigm. Well, I think also it's sort of like these old mafia businesses. They're very entrenched. They're very, they're old. They, and, and I mean, the po- the whole point of the piece that I wrote is like, if you look at the mafia strictly from a business point of view, it is a mid 20th century model, right? Like you, if you control a territory, like controlling Brooklyn, who cares, man? Yeah, We're in a cares? globalized right, exactly. economy. Right. We're in a globalized Speaking economy. Speaking too small. Right. Yeah. Of course. How are you actually supposed to make profit from that? Like, like you're like, like the big circle boys are, have been involved in the Andrecata in Italy. They like, they were the, and, and, you know, they did deals where it's like, we have access to the cheap meth and amphetamine, but you know, cocaine in Hong Kong is incredibly popular and massively expensive. I mean, the markup on an, on a gram of cocaine in Hong Kong, as opposed to LA, I mean, you just can't compare them. Right. So like, when you control these these networks, that's why the Jeff Bezos comparison is for real, right? Like you don't need hierarchies; you need systems, right? You need globalized systems, and, and you know these people are doing things like they're making cards for Hamas terrorists in Argentina. They're with the Andregata in Italy. They're with uh, they're all so they control almost all of the meth trade in Asia, and I mean they're just they're just everywhere. And they only do things that are not that don't require massive amounts of violence, and are and are and, and use their logistical networks um, to the maximum. That that is the future. Some family in New York, like beating up like local businesses for the petty change from a a chicken store. <laughs> like I mean, like how are you going to live off of that? Like the, the, like the chicken store places are going out of business. Like, yeah. like it doesn't. It, it doesn't make any sense as a model, even even if you think, if you, even if the violence makes it easy. It depends right? on your it depends on your vision, though, right? Like I, again, I'm, yeah. I'm putting it. Uh, I'm taking uh, your world and I'm throwing it into my world. But like out in Philadelphia, they don't care. They don't want to be global. They all they want to yeah, do it's is very control. it's very parochial. Yeah, they all, wanted, all they want to yeah. do is control the street corners in South Philly. <laughs> that makes them happy. Right. Look, there's some guys out there who want to run a newsstand <laughs> right. in, in Detroit, right? And then there's other people who want to be at Google. Yeah. Right? right. Like, you know, but like one of these is going to replace the other one. Right. Right. Like, like it's nice to, like, it's nice. Like, I mean, sometimes I watch these like gangster programs and I'm like, like Mon Boucher, you know, after he was in prison, he was still getting payouts and he was getting payouts of about $120,000 a month. And there are people in this world who think that that's a lot of money. For Tichy Lop, that's a hand of blackjack. <laughs> like, 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 like that, the the monthly income of like a of a uh, Mont- of a of the Montreal gangster who's so subject to violence that an indigenous group tried to hit him with a uh, with a uh, rocket propelled grenade in, in his when he was in solitary confinement in prison. Like, you know, this is a man who has to dodge bazookas. Uh, that's how much violence he lives in. Tissue Lops, you know, in, he's in the, he's in the, I mean, this didn't make it in the piece, but for many years he lived in the, in the Golden Triangle economic zone, um, where, which is the most fascinating criminal place in the world. I mean, he's literally drinking tiger bone wine. They like have farms where they grow, where they raise tigers in order to kill them for their bones to make wine out of it. That's the life that he's living. Right, like, like dinosaur like, eggs. It's like a James Bond villain. Right. It's like a James Bond. Well, like, <laughs> Jenna Red Rayos isn't going to cut it for say she loves. Right. You know Taylor I mean? like, Rayos not... doesn't have the same like cachet. It's not gonna, as, it's as not... throwing down a million dollars on a on a, a hand of blackjack. Yeah, you like you like the gravy at Rayos. That's great for you. He's like twenty levels above. Right. I mean, yeah. and um, and like and, and that's because of these, this just totally different approach, you know, to like, I mean, you know, they were they're the reason the big circle boys in Toronto are the reason why you need to put a code in when you use a visa, because when they came here, they started off as pickpockets. They took the visas and re- and took them and sent them to China to be 
to the manufacturing plants that they had left behind to be cloned and would sometimes bring back like 40,000 clones. And then you would, and then, and then, I mean, and then literally the cops trying to keep up with them. I mean, some of these cops have been chasing these people for literally generations. Like the Hong Kong Royal Police, who were a very great police force, much like the RCMP here, they, they're, they literally, the fathers who were in the Hong Kong Royal Police, their sons were in the RCMP, in the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, chasing the sons of the guys that their fathers were chasing in Hong Kong. Right, like they are, they are like, um, like, and you know, when they're caught, they they shake hands with the cops and congratulate them. Good job. They know the stakes they're playing at. They don't fight. Like the banditos go punch cops. You punch a cop, they can put you away for seven years for nothing. Right, like it's so easy to deal with. I mean, one of the guys I was talking to was this RCMP cop. He'd been seconded from Big Circle Boys to. Bandito to the when the banditos blew up that kid, it caused like this huge basic seismic change in the way law enforcement worked here. I mean, they just got real serious about putting them away. And he said it was the easiest job he ever had. I mean, he was just like, Yeah, you go up to them, they punch some guy, you put them away forever. I mean, it's like it's shooting fish in a barrel, not the big circle boys. Yeah, and and one thing that we've already addressed is is how like pragmatic they are. So I wa- I wanted to bring up the credit card fraud because and they sort of yeah. pioneered that before they they really get heavy into to meth and things like that. And so you you mentioned their background. They're like paramilitary snatch and grab guys in Hong Kong. Yeah. But they come to Canada and they recognize that that's not going to work. Like bank robbery is not yeah. going to be. That's not going to work in Toronto. It's not a cash society. Right? It's a credit right. society. Right. So they yeah. had to but, they had to like adapt. So if you could you know talk about that. Yeah, they had to. Well, they. I mean, Canada. One of the things is weird is that Canada is a very odd culture. Right. Like even like, you know, like we're talking, no one would know which one of the countries we're from. Right. Like, like, you know, there's not like I have cousins, you know, I got my Trump voting cousin in Seattle. Like, you know, I've lived in America. You know, my, I make most of my living from America. Like it's it's we're very similar. It's an intimate relationship between these countries. But there are some very weird differences. Right. I mean, one of them is that there's just no tolerance for violence in this country. Right. Like no one's allowed to have a gun. Right? You're not allowed to own a gun for personal defense in Canada. That's illegal, right? And so th- that creates very different kind of reality, right? And um, they just, and also, and the multiculturalism aspect, right? Where it's like there really is this kind of like openness to, uh, uh, to like even even among the criminal. I actually thought that was one of the most like heartening aspects of Canada I'd ever read. It's like even the criminals are involved in multiculturalism. Like they don't want they're they're not they're not involved in uh in racial hatred. I think that's pretty fascinating. But the um they completely adapted right away. They're an elite. They're a global elite, right? And like one of the things is like they when the police um you know they will occasionally have had task forces where they you know use different methods to try and uh work out what, because they don't have a hierarchy, right? They don't. There's no like boss, right? There's just, they're just business people. Some t- they try to make deals with each other and then other groups. Um, so they don't. There's no one, um, and they reform for every job, right? So there's no people, right? There's no. That's why there's no one for me to talk to, right? There's no like group that he controlled. It's just he's making arrangements with various different people at various times. Um, so because of that, like. They would do these task forces. They would get the names, and then they would realize that they'd all gone long ago. You know, they they use they use they use these credit cards, and then they'd be in Arizona, and they'd be in Brazil, and they'd be in Holland, and they'd be in and they'd be in Malaysia. Like they just weren't like they are truly they're they're refugees, but they're fully integrated into international networks in a way that I mean, you know, some like guy in you know some corner dealer in Detroit is the exact opposite of that, right? Like never been outside of his neighborhood, never been, you know, never been outside. Doesn't, never aspi- been, doesn't aspire. Yeah. Doesn't aspire. Well, yeah. I don't think, this is just their world too, right? They've been kicked around the world. They've been kicked out of Guangzhou. They've been, they were from rural China originally. They've been kicked out of Guangzhou. They're kicked out of Hong Kong. They were, you know, they were, they were in Toronto for a while in Vancouver. Then they moved from there to, I mean, he was caught in, 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 um, in Holland, the most damage he did to any country was Australia. I mean, the size of the meth epidemic in Australia, 7% of Australians have tried meth, right? I mean, yeah, in America, in America, it's 0.4%, right? 
right? And I mean, and people are dying on the streets in America. In in Australia, it's got a, it's a full blown crisis in in uh, in Australia. Um, so, and then he's you know he's everywhere. Bamboo Union. You, I mean, how many people in history could make a deal with the Bamboo Union? Thirty thousand members in Taiwan, right? With the Yakuza in Japan, Australian biker gangs. I mean. It, 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 it's a, it, who could even have conversations with all of these people? Uh, only a, a, a tiny little globalized elite, you know, like yeah. a tiny little globalized elite. Yeah, it also reminds me of a, a parallel with um, since we mentioned the Rizzuto's, uh, mm. the, the Sicilians, um, when when the FBI and DEA were investigating Sicilian mafiosi in the United States in the eighties, um. They had this uh, observation that for the um, I can't remember the exact quote, but it was something like for the Italian American mafioso, uh, their territory is their neighborhood. For the Sicilian right. mafiosi, like the Rizzutos, their territory is the globe, <laughs> the <Right>. world. <laughs> and yeah. so it remi- that that's what it reminds me of with with the guys we're talking about. Like, uh, yeah. again, it, it it's it's very. Um, very cosmic. Well, the Rizzutos, the, the Rizzutos were really important, like, you know, because also the way the Rizzutos ended in a blood feud, right? Like, I mean, this saying, is, wait, this hold is, on. Wait, wait, hold on. Yeah. Back up, back up. Are you saying it's right. over with? I mean, I'm being honest. Well, I'm, I'm being saying, totally serious. Are you saying the Rizzuto crime family is done? Well, it certainly is nowhere. Well, I think all of well, these families are nowhere near. Well, what that's they true. Were. But saying, yeah, I mean, that they're, saying that they don't exist anymore would be breaking no, no. news, at least for my audience. Well, I would say this, that if you're buying cocaine in Montreal or Toronto um, today, you're buying it off of a biker gang. Like, you know, I mean, like that is that ultimately that is who you are buying it from. Right. And that would definitely not have been true in 1990. Um, and the reason and the reason they lost all that power was the violence. You know, I'm, just having, like, I'm just having fun. I'm just having fun with you, Steven. No, no, no. Well, <laughs> well, look. I mean, it's not like I'm a big reporter on this stuff. Right. Like, it's not like I'm. I'm not like this is a. I wrote this story because I really was interesting to me as a business story about like I, about these. You know, even the, how these globalized logistical chain networks are the future in everything. Like, not in like like they're the future in organized crime as much as they're the future in you know bicycle part manufacturing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, and and, and like and and. So it's not like I'm super familiar with all that stuff. On the other hand, like, you know, those those old um, families are decrepit yes. in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very clear way. And I mean, in, in the case of the Rizzutos, it really was this war that they got into over various murders that just, you know, sapped all their energy. Yes. And, 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 and that, it, like, it just, it, just, it just literally distracts from business. I would, right? say and then, I would definitely say they're on life support now. I mean, what you yeah, said, I, mean, I don't do, I don't necessarily, I'm not that far away from going right. what you just said. Like yeah. they are I, five years from now, they might not exist at all. Or from what I've been predicting, you know, uh, on this pod and on some of my writing is that they'll just, they'll become a wing of the Hells Angels. Those well, Hells Angels I mean, will absorb them. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, well. I mean, we haven't seen the stuff here where the Mexican cartels have really taken, you know, like they haven't, where they've taken control of local distribution, like they have, when, like you see that in, in various cities. And I think that's almost, that's pretty much true in Vancouver now. But like, it, we, we haven't seen that. It's still like the, the Hells Angels and stuff like that. And the Hells Angels can't survive. They're a functioning, they're a functioning crime unit. Like that business model still makes sense in some ways. I just, I just don't think, like it's not necessarily the punishment from law enforcement um, so much as it's just that this business model doesn't work anymore, right? Like, it's like, like that's why they're falling. Like, and Vito and Vito Rizzuto died and didn't have yeah. a a succession plan in place that whether yeah. or not it, you know, ideally his his son would have been able to handle this, and it doesn't yeah. look like now that we're ten years removed from Vito Rizzuto dying, it doesn't look like. Um, at least the son that is allegedly in charge now, he's a lawyer by trade. He's not a mob boss. It, that, that's not really, well, I mean, you know, I think, you know, any successful family would want to get their kids out of organized crime. Well, that's why this right? guy, yeah, wasn't I mean, supposed, they, he wasn't supposed yeah, to I mean, be a part of the crime family. He was yeah, and I mean, why, why, but I think, you know, the question that the Big Circle boys bring up really is like, um, 
why are you doing this? Like, like, what is the point of doing this? Like, it, because the violence is not functional, right? Like, the, the, the violence is not actually a sign of your, or your capacity to have power. It's the opposite, right? Like, the way that you conquer people in the 21st century is by giving them a deal that is so sweet they can't they, they they can't say no to. I mean, it is like I, I I made him an offer he couldn't refuse. I mean, that's literally what Say Chill Up did, but it wasn't a bullet. It wasn't a gun in somebody's head. It was like, how about I give you the pro- the product that you are making at cost with no risk to you? I yeah. mean, like 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 that's way more powerful than I'm going to kill you. Like it's it, I mean, it's so much more powerful. If you don't right? have to and, kill people. You're you're yeah. doing the reason you're killing people is because things are going wrong, right? Yeah, and they they there is some record of them. Like the, another thing that's interesting from a criminological perspective about the Big Circle Boys is that they, you know, the uh, what's it what's it called the efficiency uh, uh, cost hypothesis, where it's like, it, you know, if you to be to be secretive from the police requires all this effort, and is it economically viable to keep? They were extremists on that. So like they when they were hiring hitmen, um, which they did, which they had to do when they were making some deals in the in the 90s, they literally would t- 10 times the price to get middlemen to buy it. And they would they would eventually hire like Vietnamese guys from Boston would come up to commit to commit murder for them. Right. And it was on, on very, very rare occasions. Right. And um, and that and also like when they found the guy in um, in on a boat in Asia, who was one of his agents, they found him with 50 SIM cards. That's how much cloning they were doing to cover their car, their call. Right. Like they were they were at the edge. Everything that they could do to hide what they were saying was at the edge of technology. Right. Like there was no there was no they took there was no risk that they could m- mediate that they didn't. But I'm sorry that they they always did it. They always took the maximum available effort to hide themselves, which I think is also speaks to like just the seriousness of purpose, really, that um, that I don't think any other criminal organization can get to. They're just, you know, they're like they're like right on the edge of what's possible. Yeah, it's interesting also from a criminological perspective, this idea of what are you in this for? And this was an observation in, in uh, one of Scott's books about uh, or Mafia Prints about uh, Phil Leonetti, who was a uh, uh, underboss in Philadelphia. And I, this always struck me as very interesting as, as a criminologist that Phil Leonetti made this point in Scott's book that there's a difference between racketeers and gangsters. And oh and, uh, yes, you know, and so, oh my God! Is and I always ever... thought that was a really interesting insight, and and I think that informs a lot of this discussion here of of what we're talking about between the 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 sort of the guy the the, the street neighborhood tough guy who wants to be a gangster yeah. versus the versus the the racketeer who's thinking as a business person and who's thinking global. Well, I mean that that's what the FBI told me. Like Mark at the FBI, I mean, just such a great guy, and the guys who caught him. The guys who caught Shane Chilov the first time, that was really the subject of my my article was like Mark Callan at the FBI. But it was also Mario Lamoth at, at um, a Montreal cop who is described. Everyone describes as in the Hall of Fame of policemen. He's like uh, he's out there all the time. You know, he and he really knew these communities intimately, intimately. Um, and, you know, like I, I think when you if you want to just make money. Um, you start to realize that violence is not really endurable for long, right? Like it's not like it, you can't like it destroys you. It, it like it eats you up, and it, it destroys your family, and it destroys who you are as a person. And it, everyone knows that, right? Like so, if you're at a certain point, the, the 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 successful people get themselves out of violence anyway, right? Um, and then and then it sort of becomes like, well, why would you even? You don't need to do it. Right. Like why? Like, so why are you doing this? Because you're sick in the head and you I mean, like violence <laughs> or, or like, you know, right, right. really the equivalent of yeah. what he's talking about to what I cover on a day to day basis and my expertise. And I think I was able to get this across in the uh, first season of Blowing Money Fast, uh, my documentary that's on stars. This is Black yeah. Mafia. Fam- this is Black Mafia family. Right. Black Mafia family took over the entire 
country, pretty much the entire country's retail and wholesale drug operation in in, Coke. in the two thousands in cocaine. Obviously, working with the right. cartel, working with the cartels on yeah. the supply, on the supply side, but they rolled into twenty different cities around. You know, leave, they they were founded in Detroit. They left Detroit. Right. They rolled into St. Louis, Atlanta, Chicago, uh, New yeah. York, L.A., and nobody's dropped. Nobody's dropped. Yeah. It was Demetrius right. Plenary. Surprisingly, un- um, yeah, it was uh, not as violent as you would think from the, those. There was no the, 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 And Demetrius Plenary, what he said, what what Stephen's saying, Demetrius Plenary went to all of the shot callers in all of those cities, and he sat right. down with them and made them a simple pitch. The same way right. that that uh, that we're talking about here in in, in Canada, and those yeah. guys could they couldn't refuse it. How, it was good, how, it was like, good why would you? Why would you say no? I mean, you know, Mark told me like the thing he said is like it's almost like from the higher to the lower is the more like you you, you have two things happen. One up here, like you know, Tink Chilov's dealing with absolutely one hundred percent pure heroin in the like you know bricks of six hundred and sixty six grams. Um, in like from the triangle, and then as you go lower, and he looks like a school teacher. He looks like a well dressed school teacher. I mean, like he's wearing Gucci, but you know he looks like a, a, a teacher who bought himself a nice piece of clothing, like an accountant with a with a good practice. That's all that he looks like. And then as you go down, they look more gangsterish. <laughs> they they need yeah. to act tougher, and the drugs get lower quality, right? Until like you're at the bottom where you have like very stepped on cocaine and heroin. And so on with people, you know, who like basically scream, I'm a gangster. Yeah. And stabbing right. each and, other in the bathrooms of dirty taverns and, yeah. and you know, bad areas of bad cities. It, it, what, one of the things I found fascinating is how much the cops appreciate them not fighting. Like when they catch them and they shake their they all mention that. Like they all mention like when they catch them, they show up in some restaurant in Hong Kong. They get Seichi Lop. He shakes their head and says, good job. You got me. Where are we going? Right. Like, like he, like he's not a, uh, and then he pleads guilty. He goes, he knows the stakes, right? Like he knows, like if you're in this business and you get caught, you go to jail. Like why? Like, like what, like there's no point getting angry about it. They don't get angry. And it's one of those things where it's like, like your mother told you, like manners actually matter. Yeah. Like, like, like there's, there's a certain, there's a certain level of respect that these cops have for these guys, even though they are the arch criminals, right? They, they are the absolute pinnacle of of crime and cause untold harm, right? Untold quantities of poison. Um, but you know, they they're they're business people. They're not you know they're not blowing people up. In, they're not blowing up people's cars with children in them. That, I mean, that's just like you know that's not that that's just not going to be allowed. Yeah, I, I, I want to um, back to the the this the, the biography um, mm-hmm. of of. Um, uh, see Chilop. um so at, because i thought this was really fascinating in your reporting too is so they they're the credit card fraud they're making a lot of money but as you've already pointed out they get into heroin smuggling they're they're supplying the italians they're supplying bikers not only in canada but in the united states um but he gets caught and he goes to jail in the united states for what about 10 what he does Elkin. like a 10 year bid something like that i think it's seven seven I think it was, was seven, seven? So, yeah. but even just within that seven years, the 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 heroin game has has shifted where the Mexican cartels have started to carve up a lot of the heroin uh, supply to the United States to Canada. So once again, he has to reinvent himself, just like just like they go from the snatch and grab bank robbers to credit cards to heroin. Um, and and so, correct me if I'm wrong. When he gets out of prison, he realizes that. Um, not that they're completely out of the heroin game, but um, they're going to shift to synthetic drugs. Yeah. Well, I think he had, I mean, it's impossible to know, but um, I think the way that he thinks through these things is like um, a private equity company. So like, I don't think he thought that he couldn't change the heroin game again. I think yeah. if he, you know, he had access to the golden triangle and he had access to Afghanistan and he had access to all this stuff. Like he, if he'd wanted to get back into the heroin game, he 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 could have, he well could have, but he knew that Asia was on the rise. He was like Asia, like Asia is coming, like it is growing rapidly, 
and that's where the money is. And just like um, Lehman Brothers or whatever decides we're going to pivot to Singapore, right? Like he decided he's going to pivot to Asia. There's just more money to be made. And then he also realized that, I mean, he, his great insight, and it is one of the greatest insights in the history of criminality, is that you could make methamphetamine so cheaply uh, with so little cost in, in all forms that, that um, you know, you could, it, it was essentially free for the producer. And that's why you could, and that's why you could guarantee delivery, right? I mean, you know, heroin, it takes, a, it takes one farmer one year to make a kilo. Right. Yeah. So that or not a kilo, even a key. So that's 666 grams. Right. So that's a there are people that you have to pay and there are people that you have to. And there's and there's and there's like resources that you need to use to extract that from that. Methamphetamine is made in buckets in Thailand for nothing. And you can make the annual supply of Australia in a couple of weeks. Right. So like it, like it really doesn't matter. And, you know, like. It's not like it is on Breaking Bad. Like there's just a there's like there's a um, a basic level of quality that once you attain, you're fine. Um, it, it, there's no there, it's not like there, there, so. And that that quality, like he used it, he wrapped his stuff in these tea bags and other producers started using those tea bags to imitate those tea packages rather to imitate them because it was a mark of acceptable quality. Right. And so he made high quality meth basically for free in Thailand. Um, and then once, once he figured out the guaranteed delivery, um, it was all over. Like it was like, there's no, like, there's just no, it doesn't make sense to say no. Right. right. So like, it, it, and so that was, I mean, those were the two, the two big insights that he had was that um, synthetics are because of, because the cost of production is basically zero. And, you know, there's no, uh, it's not like in, Australia or Canada, where to get the the chemicals is hard. Right. Like in right. in Asia, like you're buying red phosphorus straight off of a dock for you know a hundred dollars a ton or whatever. Right. Like it's not like it's. I mean, it, it is really the ingredients are free and easy to get. Um. And so the yeah, those are the two. And then and then also that Asia was the future. The right. Mar- yeah. And the so market, yeah. The mar- well, and also just the amount of money that was going to exist in Asia with the growth was so catastrophically huge from, you know, tw- 2000 to 2020. Right. Yeah. I mean, it was just it, bl- it blew up. Yeah, that's something. Um, there's so much so much to unpack here. So um, shameless self-promotion in my book, <laughs> Early Organized Crime in Detroit. Uh, some an argument that I made was, you know, whenever you see like this sort of economic development, in this case, industrial Detroit. You also see a correlation of a rise in vice. When people have disposable income, they like to gamble. They like they like their drink. They, they like it might be dope. Their city is built on vice. <laughs> right. Miami. Miami, Miami yeah, is good. built on vice. Was, yeah, the right. entire uh, skyline. The entire skyline, yeah. entire skyline of Miami right those, now. Yeah. yeah. Miami is a built on cocaine. Yeah. Right. I mean, like, like, like there, there, are, there are many, many vice is an active part of the economy. Sure. Like, yeah. I mean, people don't talk about it, but it, it is a it is absolutely a part of economic growth. Right. Like it's and the more money people have, the more drugs they take. Like that's yes. You right. Know, <laughs> right. Right. That, that's part of this, too. Yeah. So the, the idea of a, a market, it makes sense co- correlating to uh, economic development. But um, so a couple of things. Yeah. It's very interesting. Right. The, the precursor chemicals are it's it, we know that they're circulating pretty readily available in Asia, which is. For the American market, right, the Mexican cartels, that's where they're getting, you know, they're getting the, those chemicals from from yeah. uh, Asia and then, and then cooking them up in, in labs in, in Mexico. But just to give some some insight into the economics here, something I, I was, you know, researching is that I think it was in your piece was just to, so people understand the, the markup here, uh, they can produce the the brick of meth for about around $4,000 in Thailand or we're somewhere in the Golden Triangle, and then once it gets to the the outlaw bikers in Australia, the usually I think it's the Hell's Angels who are the big dogs there in Australia. Um, yeah. They're selling it for around two hundred k. Yeah, just that four thousand figure. Yeah. That's what it costs to buy it in Thailand. Oh, that's not what it yeah. costs them good, to produce good po- it. Good point. Thank you. Like yeah. to produce it costs like <laughs> whatever two hundred dollars. Yeah, right. Like it's not even like 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 you're paying ten guys. 
you know, 10 guys in the jungle to stir some pots, right? Like it's not it, it, like, like it's, it, it, it's, it doesn't cost them $4,000 to make a brick, point. not even close. That's what it costs to buy that in Thailand, but right. that's not, that's not the same thing. But then the economic zone in, in Myanmar, which is truly lawless, right? I mean, I was desperate to go. Like I, 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 you know, because I was doing some some video, some stuff for National Geographic, and I was like, I, I desperately want to go here. They were like, we need, we would need to send you with six bodyguards. Like yeah. it would be like it would be like a reporting trip, like going into Haiti. Like it would, yeah. it, it is a, it is a truly lawless place. Like no one, there is no law. There's just some gangsters, right? Yeah, drinking it, tiger bone tea, and yeah. you know. And, and like elaborate sushi in a massive casino that doubles as like a money. I mean, it's money laundering paradise, right? Um, yeah, and, and that's it, the it, other. It, that's the other thing. He was great at innovating. I mean, he was such a master innovator at um, uh, at uh, money laundering. I mean, that was his real. Yeah, he was. Oh, that was yeah. his real gift. Yeah, that was something. Because eighteen else billion did. dollars, like it's like, you know, that's not going and buying some chips at a casino and putting half on red and half on black and then. <laughs> You know, and then go and cashing out like you've got eight. I mean, he brought down two casinos in Australia, right? From from the unbelievable, shameless way they permitted him to to launder money through them. Um, but yeah, like he was. He, I mean, he used this um, particular system that because China outlaws gambling, they have these like very specific money. Like you can you give them money in China and then travel to gamble in Macau. He used them in a very innovative way, right? I mean, really, really on the edge. In yeah, fact, I'm not entirely the sure that the, the law enforcement I talked to understood it. I don't think the law enforcement people I talked to actually had fully understood it. Yeah, the the casinos in Australia. I think, yeah, you mentioned that that laundering the money through, um, but but also just casinos in Asia too, not just Australia, right? Yeah, there other Macau, Macau, and I mean, he did lose sixty million euros a night, one night playing baccarat, right? So like. You know, like, I mean, he was, you know, he was like his instinct is for massive amounts of money. Right. Like, that's what he that's the world that he lives in. And, you know, gambling is, you know, as for all Asian organized crime, I mean, I was talking to the Asian organized crime expert in Toronto. He said that when they legalize casinos and move them out to the country, um, crime in Chinatown dropped by 90 percent. Right. Like gambling is the absolute locus of Asian organized crime. It's the, it, it's the center and cause of it. And he was 100% a massive gambler, right? I mean, one way to see him is that these deals are just other gambles that he's taking. Yeah. Now, when the, in terms of like a comparative analysis, I know, I know this isn't your expertise, but we yeah. know that the big circle boys are, are networked in and dealing with the triads a lot. And the, and the Yakuza, um, but or even Hell's Angels and the, and the Italians, and but these groups they do still get violent with each other within yeah, know, yeah. other groups. Um, the does will someone like you know someone from the Big Circle Boys do they view that as just like that's not our problem? Like what you if you guys want oh, yeah. to supply you and you guys want to fight over territory or something that's 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 not well, our the problem. Big, the Big Circle Boys that name is just a name that journalists and the police have given to this these these people yeah. they would like it's not like like if you're a member of the game if you're not a member of the gambino crime family and you call yourself a gambino yeah you, this is not going to go well for you right like um but if you want to if, if i wanted to call myself a big circle boy right now there would be zero cost to that they don't have like all this is what i'm saying about organized crime like there are some people who actually think that the using the phrase organized crime to describe the big circle boys is wrong Mm -hmm. That they because they do not fit into the the the, the categories of the of the, the what keeps the the hell's angels and the triads and the mafia what unites them is that they have caught they have specific costumes they have specific patches and 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 uh identifying markers that only they are allowed to use right names uh patches on on jackets and stuff like that they take low uh, loyalty loyalty oaths yeah rituals so some triad yeah, groups, rituals practices right some triad groups have 27 separate oaths right, right. like they're, right. they're 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 very long, long oaths and then the other one is that they operate on hierarchies um there's a leader and then it goes down there's none of that with the big circle boys they, they uh, they're just they're just business people who are like a little network 
that happen to be able to put their hands on enough cocaine to put to handle a city for a year. Right. Like like if they decide they're going to do handle all the cocaine in Detroit for a year, they can put their hands on that much cocaine. Right. Wow. And, and so they're 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 not there. And that's why they're so much better. Like the, this is the thing that they reveal is how weak this old model is. These these loyalty oaths, these hierarchies, these identifying markers, they're massive weaknesses. Right. They're the source of the strength of these organizations in a lot of ways. Right. Like they, they or they were. Right. But at, in the 21st century, they none of this stuff applies. Right. right? Like none of, none of it applies to the functioning of, the, of these of the, of, the, of the kind of capitalism that we're in. It's right. The kind of capitalism that we're it, it, exactly. And it's we're in a globalized we're in a globalized economy and the mafia isn't. And, yeah. um, you know, it's interesting, actually, the Indragata is probably the closest one. I agree. To the big circle boys in the sense that they're just one massive fam, right? And that they like, and that they just keep their they, like no everyone else is ex- and, and that allows them to be international in a way that no other group can be, right? I mean, um but the, at the same time this is this is not a clannish group, the big no. circle boys. Not at all. Not at all. Yeah. And so where do you think um in terms of um um, you know, the, the problems that, that emerge from this in terms of, uh, addiction, things like that. Um, yeah, I th- you, you had some observations in your piece, if you want to share with us about, um, in terms of the criminal justice system, like you made the point about gambling. Do you think that, uh, decriminalization or legalization is, um, in terms of public policy, certainly not a panacea, yeah. but is that something you think might, um, alleviate well, some of the, I mean, the problems here? I think I would have believed that three years ago, but it's been tried a lot. And it's been a bit, I mean, I would certainly say that every single cop that I spoke to on any level um, thought that the drug war was unwinnable. And that, um, and that if you were trying to stop drug, if you're trying to stop the drug problem by stopping supply, um, it's just not going to, it's just falling, right? Like it, it just, that's just not, that's not, we know that's not an answer. Right. right? Um, but the other answer is like, you know, Vancouver and, you know, the other places that have really tried to deep the decriminalization route, um, that hasn't worked either, right? Like, I think we have to be really frank about and honest about this stuff. I think there are multiple solutions that are being tried now. I mean, we have a real debate in Canada right now where there are two approaches. There's the one in Vancouver, which is like basic decriminalization. And then there's one in Alberta, which is a, the province right beside Vancouver, where they're trying really intensive um bed like uh recovery programs like they're yeah. very intensely funding recovery programs and that but you know um not, n- I don't think there are any of these things that you can go oh that's the path yeah like i i, I don't i don't think we're we're at a place at all where we can say like oh we we th- the answer is this and the politicians just need to listen and do you know xyz policy and it'll all work out i i think we're in a much more um complex and difficult moment in trying to figure out what appropriate drug policy is for real. I, you know? I agree. I agree. I, I, I used to be a pretty radical proponent of a, just outright legalization, but even for me, me, me too, uh, certainly um, decriminalization. Yeah. I, I, but, yeah. but synthetic drugs, even for me, it, it's, 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 it's been a game changer and it's forced me to, to rethink yeah. some of my orthodoxy in terms of, uh, you know, just saying, just legalize everything. Uh, so I agree. It's very complicated. Yeah. I mean, I think decriminal, I really believe in decriminalization after seeing the example of Portugal, after seeing the example of like all these countries, these places that had tried it and, and, and it, you know, I mean, the drug war is pure folly. Right. Like it seems yeah, so stupid. It seems like almost immoral to send police in, who are very heroic. I mean, you can read about some of these guys like Peter Yuen. I mean, that's like a that's the kind of man that countries are built off of. I mean, he's just like a little lion hearted. I mean, a real tough guy. And um, why are we sending them in to fight these battles when we know the war can't be won? That 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 seems to me inherently immoral on some level, like it's, and, and, and it cannot be correct policy. But on the other hand, I mean, like the, um, the left stuff, which I definitely subscribe to when I wrote this piece. And I definitely, I, I think I would definitely say that I 
until very recently was a proponent of. I mean, you know, it's been tried and the fentanyl just, you know, it, it doesn't listen to that. Like it doesn't, <laughs> right, it, right. It, it, it's just, on, it's just on a different level. Or I mean, and, and when you see the carnage that it inflicts on these cities, right. like right. it's it, it, like, I mean, it is carnage. Like it's uh, like, it's, it's really horrific. So, I mean, I genuinely think I don't know. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. And I, it, it definitely uh, has problematized this this issue for at least people like me that used to be pretty orthodox on this. So um, yeah. a couple of things as we finish up here. Um, Say Chi Lop, what's the current state? Do we know where he where he is? Uh, He's in Australia. He fought extradition. Okay. I mean, they're never going to let him out of a cage ever again. Okay. That's what I mean. That's the long and the short. I mean. It took 20 agencies to catch him. Yeah. They are going to, like, if, like, they are going to nail him to the wall. Like, he'll never, he'll never get out again. Yeah. Do you think he's going to die in a prison in Australia? Do you think we That's will see think. someone else uh, to the same magnitude of him, or will it become more, hor- even more horizontal will it, where there will be a lot of smaller versions of, of, of him? Oh, makes- that makes sense. It makes absolutely, I mean, it will make absolutely no difference to the supply of drugs in yeah, the world. Right, right. I mean, like, I mean, as always, right? Like, I mean, you know, I, I remember talking to one agent who, like, had gone deep undercover in, where was it? It was somewhere in England, in some town. And he, like, uh, and he had, um, he had broken up this network. And it, and it took them, like, five years. And I'm talking dangerous undercover work among you know, real thugs. He said that the drug supply stopped for uh, 48 hours. Wow. That's it. Like, like there was like, there was like 48 wow. hours where there, where there wasn't drug. And then he was like, what am I doing? Yeah. Like, like, you know, like, like, what, like the, 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 I mean, the lesson of this piece to me is like market forces are more powerful than any, than any other forces. Like it, it's just, they, they, they win. Right. And, um, and, and so, you know, the big circle boys, like when you they don't even put them in hierarchies when they when they police analyze them, they put them in something they call sociograms, which are like these round. Ne- you guys probably know that you're, you're, you're professional criminologists, but it yeah, was very yeah. surprising to me how they did that. And, you know, when one node is removed from that network, there's like 89 other nodes. Right. Like it makes it makes absolutely like someone else will come up and make the deal for for the mess with the bamboo union. And it, like and it, and, it, and, it, and it, they won't have to be smart like say Chilo. They won't. Yeah, they won't have the, to be great. Right. Innovators. The systems are already in place now. That's a really good point. Right. That's a really good point. Yeah. yeah that that's a good point. Uh, before we find out more about like Steven, where we can find out more about his stuff, Scott, did you want to did you want to add anything as we as we? No, wrap this was up? great. I got to shut yeah. my mouth more on these interviews. Yeah. <laughs> I listen to my. Uh, oh no! It's just, it's just that I talk on and on and on. No, no, <laughs> no. Sometimes I I introduce myself too much in the interviews, and I get a lot of feedback telling me to like that. We'll listen to you when it's just you, but when you have a guest on, please just shut up. So yeah, that's so, what I'm. But the thing about Sechi, the thing about Sechi Lop is that he's so weird, right? Like it's not like you can compare him to. I mean, there are connections with the Rizzuto family, and there are connections with these other, but like. There are no other drug lords who like were responsible for ninety percent of the heroin in New York City, and then ran the biggest meth empire the world has ever right. known. I mean, right. it, 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 who are you going to like? There's no one to compare. Like it, Escobar is nothing. Escobar was a very successful smuggler. This is this is a completely different type of human being than this. Yeah. Right. And and, and it's just and so he's. There's not a lot. He's very unusual as an organized crime story. He's also nothing like the Asian organized crime, right? Like it's not like it's not like if you go and talk to triad people, it's like oh, he's just like a, another triad. He's not, yeah. right? Like he's something completely separate from that. Yeah, like it, it is. It is. I, I think of like a James Bond villain, but even that's not perfect because he he doesn't. He's not this like sort of megalomaniacal with propensity for violence like you would see with a James Bond villain. But a James Bond villain is about as close as I can come up in my head to. What he flies his family in for his birthday. That's what he uses the money for. He flies his family in for the birthday and like a golfing holiday on an island. Yeah, right. Like that. Like that's not a James Bond villain. Like you no, know, that he, no. <laughs> like he's just a businessman with zero conscience. Yeah, well, which, right. but in that case, there, I, there are a lot of them out there. I think, but, yeah, uh, no doubt. 
I'm, I would argue, but I don't want to get in yeah. trouble politically here. Um, so, Stephen, how can more people find out about about your writings and, and your books and your articles? And um, well, I'm on I'm on stephenmarsh.com, and I have and Twitter. I'm at Stephen Marsh. I'm, I'm just my name on Twitter. You can check me out there. Yeah, well, we we really appreciate your time and your insight, and and I, I encourage people to check out um, um, this article. And um, I I will stay in touch with you. There's a lot of other things you've written about that I would like to talk with you about privately. So I'll, sure. stay, I'll stay in touch with you. Uh, but this 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 reporting in particular really syncs well with our podcast and what we do. So um, fascinating case study. We really appreciate your time. Thanks, Stephen. Like, great to talk to you guys. Yeah, great yeah. to talk to you. Take care, Stephen. Good luck with everything. Yeah. I'm Jimmy right. Bucciolato I'm here Scott with Scott Bernstein, Bernstein and uh, we'll see you next time. OG Podcast, we're out. Mm-hmm.